Now coming to diagnosis of air or gas embolism. How do you diagnose air or gas embolism? There will be sudden fall in SpO2 or ETCO2 trace on capnogram. There will be sudden tachycardia. If at all patient is awake, he will experience severe chest pain. There will be sudden rise in central venous pressure and ECG shows ST segment depression. Even with, the, even with 0.5 ml per kg per minute of IV gas can lead to all these symptoms. So your patient anesthetic should be awake and alert. What happens sudden, because this, these complications happen suddenly, there will be sudden fall in SpO2 and ETCO2 trace will go off from the capnograph. So what is the treatment for air or gas embolism? First and foremost, maintain ABC, that is maintain airway, maintain breathing and maintain circulation of the patient. To prevent further gas embolism, occlude the operative site by compression. For example, if patient is being operated for orthopedic surgery or neurological surgery or any other polytrauma where surface area is large, you are supposed to occlude or close the surgical site with the help of your palms or with the help of bandage so that no further gas embolism occurs. Depress the gas pressurized site if any. For example, CO2 carbon dioxide if used during laparoscopy you should deflate the pneumoperitoneum as quickly as possible turn off nitrous oxide if at all it is if at all it is being used for maintenance of anesthesia lower the operative side below the heart level increase the venous pressure by by employing rapid iv administration and try and aspirate the cvp line so that Whatever gas embolism or whatever gas is present inside the central vein could be aspirated with the help of CV, CVP line and hence this embolism, whichever air or gas has entered the central venous system could be removed from the central venous system. Then moderate CPAP is employed for ventilation of this particular patient. This is how you treat the patient, ask the surgeon to apply bone wax to the operative site. This is easily done in orthopedic cases. Correct the hypovolemia by rapid IV administration. Use hyperbaric oxygen if at all it is available and avoid nitrous oxide throughout the remaining surgery. Again, repeating what are, what is the, what are the modes of treatment because it is very important as this type of complication occurs very rarely and it is very difficult to diagnose. As soon as you diagnose the complication that is of air or gas embolism, maintain airway, breathing and circulation. Prevent further gas embolism by occluding the operative site by compression using whatever things are available, readily available at the operative site. Depress the gas pressurized site for example, remove CO2 in cases of laparoscopic surgeries. Turn off nitrous oxide if it is, if it is being used for maintenance of anesthesia. Lower the operative site below the heart level. Increase the venous pressure by rapidly IV administration. Aspirate the CVP line even if you are able to aspirate 0.5 ml of gas this causes drastic changes in the uh, well-being of the patient apply moderate CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure ask the surgeons to apply bone wax to the operative site correct hypovolemia as quickly and as effectively as possible hyperbaric oxygen if at all it is available should be used and avoid nitrous oxide for remaining surgery this is the this forms the mainstay of air or gas embolism now coming back to the next complication or next emergency which happens is aspiration. Risk factors are full stomach or delayed emptying time and patient is being anesthetized without proper NBM status of the patient or nil by mouth status of the patient. Patient having known refluxes or gastroesophageal reflux, raised intracranial pressure, recent trauma, diabetes mellitus, perioperative use of perioperative opioids and topical anesthesia airway. These are the risk factors which cause aspiration. Basically, aspiration means aspiration of gastric contents into the lungs. This occurs by the risk factors just as I mentioned below. Full stomach, delayed gastric emptying time, no gastroesophageal reflux, raised intracranial pressure, recent trauma, diabetes mellitus, perioperative opioids and topical anesthesia. How do you diagnose this? By auscultating, you can auscultate and Feel the V's and cryptations which, are, uh, which you can feel at the base of the lungs on both the sides. Chest x-ray will show diffuse infiltrative pattern in right lower lobe. These are the diagnostic signs of aspiration. How do you manage aspiration? Avoid general anesthesia. 
if at all in these cases of aspiration or in cases with known gastroesophageal reflex, if at all you have to administer anesthesia or general anesthesia in this particular patients, use rapid sequence indu induction, use 100% uh, oxygen, suction the oropharynx thoroughly, patient if at all it is unconscious and, uh, and spontaneous breathing required pressure is maintained, if omitting is there, uh, if patient is suffering from omitting, avoid required pressure. And if patient is apneic and unconscious, intubate immediately. After intubating, use orogastric tube to deflate the stomach. This, is, this forms the mainstay of management of aspiration. First and foremost, avoid GA. If at all you are supposed to give GA and you are left with no other choice other than giving general anesthesia, use rapid sequence induction, that is use 100% oxygen, suction the oropharynx, if patient is unconscious and spontaneously breathing, play, maintain your cricoid and if vomiting is present, avoid the cricoid. A patient, if at all, is unconscious and is apneic, immediately intubate the patient. Nasogastric aspiration, as I said, should be done. Chest x-ray is done. Maintain SpO2 from 90 to 95 percent. If foreign body or rigid fibro, foreign body is present, use rigid fibro or fibro optic bronchoscopic to remove the foreign body. Use of steroids and prophylactic antibiotics should be employed so that aspiration could be treated effectively. Coming back again to management of aspiration, avoid general anesthesia, use rapid sequence induction. If patient is spontaneously breathing, maintain cricoid. If patient is vomiting, avoid cricoid. If patient is unconscious, immediately intubate the patient. Nasogastric aspiration should be done, chest x-ray should be done, maintain SPO2 as around 90 to 95 percent. If foreign body is present, it is removed with the help of rigid or fiber optic bronchoscope, use of steroid and liberal use of prophylactic antibiotics. This forms the mainstay of aspiration, which is one form of anesthetic emergency. We're talking about malignant hyperthermia. This is an important anesthetic emergency which can be encountered. I have encountered in my clinical practice around three to four patients who were suffering from malignant hyperthermia. What are the risk factors? Family history of malignant hyperthermia forms the mainstay of uh, mainstay of this uh, main risk factor in uh, cases of malignant hyperthermia, exposure to scoline. Some of the patients who are allergic to scoline and are exposed to scoline may develop this particular complication that is malignant hyperthermia. Some patients are uh, does not tolerate vol volatile anesthetics well and may lead to malignant hyperthermia or exertional heat stroke or strabismus surgery. These are the risk factors which may lead to malignant hyperthermia. Now, how do you diagnose lock jaw or masseter spasm after giving scoline? This explains, this is the first sign of patient having malignant hyperthermia. After giving injection scoline, patient develops masseter spasm or lock jaw. There is unexplained tachycardia, unexplained rise in end tidal CO2 and with falling SpO2, despite increase in FiO2. There is generalized rigidity, cardiac arrhythmias follow and core temperature of the body rise by around 2 degrees Celsius per hour. These are the signs that you diagnose the patient is suffering from malignant hyperthermia. I will repeat them for you. The first, first and foremost is lockjaw which develops or lock jaw or masseter spasm which develops after giving injection scoline. There is sudden unexplained tachycardia. There is unexplained rise in end tidal CO2. There will be falling oxygen saturation despite increase in FiO2. Generalized rigidity throughout the body. Cardiac arrhythmias ensue and core temperature of body increases by around 2 degrees Celsius per hour. These are signs of malignant hyperthermia. How do you treat it? As, as mentioned in any of the anesthetic emergencies, maintain A, B, C, that is airway, breathing and circulation. This forms the mainstay of managing any anesthetic emergency. Turn off all volatile anesthetics which are used. No scoline should be given to this per these patients. Hyperventilate the patient with 100% oxygen. IV dantrolene, which is available with 20 as 20 milligram ampule should be given 1 milligram per kg to the patient intravenously. Stop the surgery or if at all you have to continue the surgery, continue it with TIVA or total intravenous anesthesia. 
reduce the core temperature of body by using ice pack, cold IV line, give cold gastric lavage and cold bladder wash. By doing this, you decrease the core temperature of body which is rising rapidly by 2 degrees Celsius per hour. Then invasive BP and CVP lines should be uh, employed to monitor, also monitor renal failure, clotting factors should be monitored for DICs and in vitro muscle contraction test that is IVCTS should be done, investigated thoroughly in these patients of malignant hyperthermia. So again coming back to treatment of malignant hyperthermia, I will repeat it for you. How do you manage patient with malignant hyperthermia? First maintain ABC that is airway breathing circulation, turn off all volatile anesthetics, no schooling should be used in this particular patient, hyperventilate the patient with 100% oxygen, IV dantrolin should be given 1 mg per kg to the patient, stop the surgery as quickly as possible and if at all you cannot stop the surgery and some part of surgery is remaining, you continue the surgery with TIVA that is total intravenous anesthesia. Reduce the cold temperature of body by using ice packs, cold IV line, cold bladder wash and cold gastric lavage. Invasive monitoring with invasive BP and CVP lines, monitor ARF, monitor clotting factors and in vitro muscle contraction tests. Now, anaphylaxis, this is also one form of emergency, risk factors is IV administration of any antigen, anaphylaxis can occur by administration of any antigen, it could be antibiotic, it could be analgesic, it could be anti-inflammatory drug, it could be inducing agent, it could be maintenance agent, any agent in this, any drug in, in this world can cause anaphylaxis. So they are the risk factors. What are the uh, diagnosis? How do you diagnose anaphylaxis? First of all, in 88% of cases, there will be cardiovascular system collapse, CVS will collapse totally, bronchospasm occurs in around 36% of, of your patients, angioedema occurs in 24% patients, rash is present in 13% and urticaria in 8.5%. These are grossly given, this is not 100% right, but this is how uh, patients react to anaphylaxis. Almost 88% have cardiovascular collapse. 36% have bronchospasm, angioedema is present in 24%, rash is present in 13% and urticaria in 8.5%. How do you manage? Again, check ABC as, you, as I said, told before, maintain airway, breathing and circulation. Maintain the airway with 100% oxygen. IV fluids including crystalloids and colloids could be given rapidly. IV adrenaline in 50 microgram per IV increments should be given at a rate of 100 microgram per minute till bronchospasm is relieved. That is adrenaline drip should be started. It should be given in 50 microgram increments at a rate of 100 microgram per minute until bronchospasm is relieved. Use of antihistaminic, liberal use of steroids, adrenaline drip just as I mentioned below 0.05 to 0.1 microgram per kg per minute and bronchodilators if still bronchospasm is persistent can be ensued to treat anaphylaxis. Now the other form of uh, emergency is unsuccessful reversal. Sometimes even after taking proper care and proper precaution, patient is not being able to reverse properly or patient does not regain consciousness even after surgery is over and even after giving all the reversal drug to the patient. This is called unsuccessful reversal. What are the risk factors in unsuccessful reversal? First and foremost is recent muscle relaxant dose. That's why I always mentioned and I have mentioned during my uh, module of general anesthesia, whenever patient is not being able to away, awaken after the surgery, first and foremost thing you should do is check the time when last muscle relaxant dose is given. Then the second risk factor is renal or hepatic impairment, hypothermia, acidosis and electrolyte imbalance, presence of myasthenia gravis, aminoglycoside antibiotic use and low or abnormal plasma cholinesterase. These are some of the risk factors which due to which due to presence of which there may be unsuccessful reversal. So how do you diagnose an unsuccessful reversal? Uncoordinated or jer jerky movements of the body, train of four test may be positive, double burst stimulation may be present and post tetanic count be high. 
So these are the methods by which you diagnose unsuccessful reversal. This is very important from MCQ point of view. How do you diagnose a patient who has an unsuccessful reversal in spite of given reversal dose with injection neostigmine or anticholinesterase drug? These are the points that is uncoordinated jerky movements, train of four test positive, double bus stimulation present and post tetanic count is high. And how do you manage an unsuccessful reversal? It is very simple. First, maintain ABC. This is simple and safe method. Maintain airway, breathing and circulation of the patient. Ensure that adequate dose of neostigmine or anticholinesterase drug is given. Check for hypothermia and if at all hypothermia is present, treat hypothermia. If check for acidosis, if at all acidosis is present, check for acidosis and treat the acidosis with the help of soda bicarb. Check for any electrolyte imbalance. Give IV calcium gluconate because when muscle relaxant is given for long duration, the calcium stores of the muscle get drastically reduced and uh, the amount of calcium present in the body gets reduced as a result of which there will be hypocalcemia. So, give calcium supplementation and see if tone of the body is increased. Wait patiently. Suspect myasthenia gravis in such patient. Look for the history of patient. Uh, take, take the history of patient from the relatives whether he has any, any such episodes during previous surgeries or has such myasthenia, has such muscle weakness during the past. Consider any dual phase block. Also, look at the time at which last muscle relaxant is given. After looking at all these things, wait patiently till such time that patient awakens by itself. And when patient awakens by itself, then and then only extubate the patient. Otherwise, continue ventilating the patient and giving 100% oxygen to the patient. This is how you manage unsuccessful reversal. In this, uh, in this complication, patience is the key. Anesthetic should never lose patience and should never lose school and should be as steady, rock steady as possible because if anesthetic loses his school, he will, patient will be never be able to be reversed from anesthesia and patient will have only one complication that is death. So his life depends on the hand, in the hands of the anesthetist and hence anesthetist has to remain cool in such life threatening situation. So this is how I have talked some of the complications or anesthetic emergencies which happen and I have talk, talked briefly how do you manage each and every one of them. I think by the end of this session you will come to know that by anesthetic emergencies they occur very spontaneously rapidly without giving any warning hence all the anesthetists should be alert and should be able to diagnose and treat it appropriately adequately and in time so as to save the life of patient because life of patient is in your hands. Thank you very much.